Well, Jeff Lutz and I slept really, really well last night. <laughs> yeah. I speak separately. You. you may not. Yeah, separately. Yeah. <laughs> Separated by half a <laughs> continent, actually. But yeah. Jeff, um, you know, I've done, I, uh, my wife even said I was yelling this morning when I did my early show. Uh, so I've, I've already talked a lot about what I saw yesterday, although there's so much more. I could go on for hours. But I'd like to maybe start off with you at a high level. What were your first impressions and takeaways as we're up 40 bucks this morning as we're starting to record this? Yeah, uh, it was a great earnings call all around. It was it was end to end, wire to wire from the, you know, the opening remarks to the Q&A all the way all the way to the end. And there were several nuggets throughout it, but at, at a high level. What I what I saw is Tesla connecting the older conventional auto business and showing you the ladder or the bridge or the you know the the direct connection to what they're building, what they're doing, and 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 those steps along the way of how they're going to get there, and and a lot of that revenue and that gross margin is actually starting to already drop to the bottom line. The bears uh, are besides themselves in many respects. A lot of, and, and a lot of, I would say, um, I don't know, I don't know, just less analysts that are kind of just like single minded focus are trying to strip everything out of the earnings and saying, well, if this, if this were General Motors, like this would be their earnings, but this isn't General Motors. This is a company that can build EVs profitably. That's why other companies have to pay them credits. This is a company that has, arguably the most prolific software and services portfolio and autonomy capability of anything. It's not even arguable anymore in terms of a global. And, and this is, this money is starting to fall and drop to the bottom line. And when I look at it in, in kind of my area of expertise, when I look at the company from a supply chain perspective, they crushed it. Their supply chain team, and the teams that work with supply chain, like engineering and the, the gigafactories, those teams work together and they delivered a record lowest cogs. Yeah. They maintain their channel inventory while they increase production by 15, 16%, which is very difficult to do when you're, when you're doing that in just from one quarter to the next and you're increasing production that much in consecutive quarters and to maintain your channel inventory. And then I went and looked at the balance sheet inventory. That was static quarter over quarter. Their payment, you know, I looked at their payments and and and, and AJ talked about this too on, on X. He's a great account to follow. You know, there's somewhere around, they went from, you know, around 63 days of payments a lot of auto companies are north of 75 or so in terms of payment terms to their suppliers. So I just look at this thing. And then of course that all, that all, what, what did all those things mean? Inventory cogs, that all means gross margins and cash. Nice. And they, and from an expectations perspective, they threw off almost double the cash that the street was expecting. They crushed gross margins by 200 basis points. And even Zeb credits were down sequentially, you know, quarter on quarter. It's a, still a big portion of the business, but guess what? It's, this is the 44th quarter in a row that they're, that they're bringing in Zeb credits as revenues. It's from multiple countries. It's, this isn't a thing. This isn't like a one-time thing. This is like, this happens until they start, all these other countries start building EVs in volume profitably. And, and that's not on the uh, immediate horizon. So just a home run all around, but really that connection to the next phase of their business was very evident. So what I thought about with you, Jeff, <clears throat> based on your experience, based on your knowledge, based on where you've been, is what is going on in the C-suites this morning at General Motors, Ford, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BYD, Toyota. What are these people saying that they must have had a meeting? They must have called an emergency meeting this morning. <laughs> yeah, and I will tell you, the, one of the greatest portions of the call is when Tesla, for the first time, went in arrears looking at 
their FSD autonomy AI performance. And they showed you from the beginning of the year when they went end to end, which you have a data point, you have a date and you have an intervention level and you have the amount of compute that they had online. And where they are today, they've had a three orders of magnitude improvement or a thousand X improvement. And Tesla has the total fleet data. This is what is important. And again, as the next chief quality officer of, of Fortune 500 companies, I will tell you this, you can't look at these data, you can look at small data sets and you can, and, and you could draw conclusions from them. But if, if, you're, if you're trying to derive anything of statistical significance, you've got to look at the, these broader data sets. Tesla has, there's hundreds of thousands of vehicles that are using FSD they've got the data suite that tell, you know, that, that it was able, they were able to basically plot those points in arrears. And why is that so important? Because now this is starting, it looks like it's starting to follow scaling laws. So as they bring this compute online, they're able to drive real world AI performance in a manner that could potentially be predictable. And so you have the relative improvement, the, the massive improvement just in less than one calendar year, and you have the ability to plot forward. So if you're in the C-suite of one of these companies and you have a multi-billion dollar burn on your autonomy program, let's say you know you have crews, for example, or what have you, at some point, you have to you have to ask yourself: Am I going to continue to drive this burn rate, and to what end? Like, when when do I converge, and what do I have? Or am I going to partner with this company, who, if I get in early enough, I will probably get the market faster than everyone else, who, uh, and then I will probably get in with the best deal possible if I get in early enough. So I think that's got to be one of the prime. It's it's actually less so much of like, how do they, how do they, you know, how do they bottom and grow smart? How do they do all this stuff? How, it's more, it's more of, you know, this company is, is not just an auto company anymore. They have this massive moat and how do we be, how do we become a part of it and work with them? And then how do we look, how do we look introspectively at what we're doing and figuring out, is it worth the burn rate? Uh, what we're doing? Do we have a point of convergence? Is it going to be as good as a Tesla solution? Is the, and, and when I say as good as forget about just interventions only, but how about the ability to scale it? Can I get it out in volume? What is the cost of the inference that's inside of the vehicle? What is the cost to serve customers? What is the total cost of the solution? And if it's so pro prohibitively high, that is, that is the, the current barrier today. To, to, people ask like, well, why, why don't the current robot, like, why aren't they out in infinity, just mapping every street in every city? Why aren't they just out there? The answer is cost. And, and, and so anyway, so these, I think that the, the, that's, I think that's gotta be one of the main conversations are, are, is around their own autonomy solution versus what Tesla just articulated on that call. That was a huge, huge bit of information on that call. So you have a situation where no other company, Elon Musk says, no other company has a has a profitable battery electric vehicle division. Even BYD apparently has to add their hybrids or their buses or their batteries or all the other things that they do. They have to add that in in order to get to profits. But the, he believes that they're not profitable um, in their in their battery electric vehicle vehicle division, and that nobody else is even <laughs> even on even on their balance uh, even on their profit and losses, nobody else is showing a profit. So they're already not able to come to profits on the underlying vehicle. And now, Elon has said just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was at the ten ten show, where he said that it's it, he doesn't know if Tesla would have ever really made it if it wasn't for the combination of electric and automation. And now he's in the showing, future, yeah. And yeah. now he's showing you a roadmap, a very specific roadmap of where he's going with the hardware and the software where there's I don't see how they have any hope of competing. Yeah, and and you, you never want to 
to count anyone out. There could be a disruptor that comes in. There could be a new solution, something that ramps up more quickly. You, you don't want to count the Chinese out per se, but if if the Chinese were profitable in pure EV, they, they would break it out. Just given the massive growth in their own country of, of pure EV, they would certainly break it out and they would certainly show it. Uh, at some point, they may become profitable um, in it, but it, it, you know today, and then GM doesn't break it out, but they told you they're not profitable and they gave you a kind of a forward date for when they think they could on a variable basis starting. Rivian told you Rivian is pure EV and they're not profitable. And they, they told you that they're not going to even make it in the time frame they originally prescribed. We know Lucid Motors. Um, we know all these companies that these companies, e, EVs are the only EVs. And I guess, you know, hybrids are still growing. If you have a growing segment in terms of uptake, you would certainly want to break out and show its profitability if it was profitable. And so if you're a pure EV company, you're forced to do it. If you're not a pure EV company and you're, and you're trying to participate in this massive growth segment, you'd show it if you're profitable and they're, they're not. And, and that, and, and that, and that's more than a scale thing. That's, I think what people misinterpret it's, it, it's, it's these decisions that Tesla makes from an engineering perspective at what it, the decisions that Franz makes and the two teams working together, and it's a, of course they're great supply chain teams, and the leverage they've be, been able to create in the industry. When Tesla walks into a supplier, and they ask for a bid, first off, they don't have to do this. These suppliers are banging their doors down. This is how it works in the real world. Been there. Been there. Uh, it, been that they have the number one selling vehicle. So what happens in that situation is when you have a segment like auto, and you have the number one selling vehicle. And and you're not spreading your volume over 20 different models like a you know BYD or other companies. If you're a supplier and you want to get an award and work with that company, you and you land on the Model Y, you know your one investment from an ROI perspective of I got to put this tooling in my shop to build this part for Tesla to go on the Model Y. You will have the greatest potential of the highest ROIC by getting on the highest volume product, and that's what you know that's the leverage that tesla has and they not only have the current product leverage they have the forward product leverage and this is what people in the industry this is what they use to you know to to drive these partnerships with suppliers and look it's not a it's not a win lose thing for tesla these i'm sure tesla has made the careers and the companies of of companies that would not have even existed if it weren't for tesla so it's not a win lose thing. It's like, look, there's tremendous leverage working with us. You could, you know, and you see where we're going to go from a growth perspective. We told you where we said we you know, we in in 2017 we told you where we'd be in 2020, and we landed on it. Mm -hmm. And now it's you know, of course, the last year or two, the growth has been you know is is been uh, it's the growth hasn't been there, but the volume has been stable. So if you're a supplier, at least like you don't have this drop off. But now they're showing you the next phase of growth. So they've got suppliers beating their door down and they have new product categories that even greater growth if you're talking Optimus. Um, and even Cyber Cab is a, even though it's a car, it's a new category of product because it's going to replace conventional transportation and it will probably come at a volume clip. I mean, 2 million of a single car, two to 4 million is the range that Elon gave. I mean, there's, I mean, and at that price point, I mean, there's nothing like it. So everybody missed. I mean, everybody that had a, that, that gave a number. I won't even go through the list because it's, it. I don't want to embarrass them. They're my friends. <laughs> so yeah. every, everybody was way, way off on the earnings number. What would you think are a couple of the reasons why this miss was so big? One of the things that I talk about on your show and in others is that Tesla has a unique ability uh, with their management of cogs. They, they, they're organized differently inside of their company and they have that forward leverage I was just talking about from a current portfolio and future portfolio. They have that low model count. So they have very high volume per part number. They obviously do a great job on unit economics and simplifying design and so forth. 
and they have a continuous program that's running. So inside of Tesla, there is an engineering and supply chain and gigafactory list of event driven changes that they're going to put onto the three and Y to take costs out. They're constantly taking costs out and then they're taking those learnings and they're, and they're bringing them into the next, um, the next vehicle, the, um, the other, the other, so they have a unique ability with cogs, both from a bottoms up perspective, a leverage perspective within the industry and how efficient they are with, with their product portfolio and, and, and number of models. And that comes from the CEO all the way down. This isn't like some, like it's now organic inside of Tesla cause he's made it that way but it wouldn't necessarily be organic or continue to be organic. This comes from the CEO all the way down. The second thing is on cash. And I even, I even posted about this well before earnings yesterday that they're, they're kind of in a class by themselves in terms of their channel inventory is extremely low. It's almost, I mean, if you, if 19 days, you know, in, in a third, let's say a third of that or a half of that is in transit. That means they only have, just over a week of inventory and conventional auto companies carry eight to 10 weeks of, of inventory just in the dealer channel. And then you go look at their balance sheet and they increase production almost, you know, I think 15 to 20%. I'd look at the exact number and their balance sheet inventory was static, which means they were turning their inventory even faster than before. And so that, that that's, gives them a unique ability to kind of throw off cash. And of course they have these high gross margin things that they can bring to the bottom line that other companies can't because they can make EVs profitably and others can't, they've got to pay them Zev credits because they have, you know, FSD and all this R and D that they put in that. Remember they dumped billions of dollars in infrastructure and resources over a decade building out FSD and now they're getting paid for it. It's as simple as that. So these things are harder for conventional analysts to, um, to forecast. The COGS are actually difficult to forecast. What I talked about with COGS are conceptual things that are, are actually happening in reality, but they're hard to put a 30 cent, $1 here, $1. They're hard. It's hard. It's hard to forecast. So this is why a lot of people, uh, a lot of people miss it's, you know, COGS and, and, and their inventory. And then, which helps them throw off the cash. And then, you know, all the, this new, these new source, these sources of revenue, which are, are new and they're going to be permanent. So, so the, on the call, they talked about a couple of things. They talked about the fact that the cyber trucks were now profitable. So that would be a, a, a good addition to the uh, bottom line is going from uh, cyber trucks being a drag to cyber trucks being uh, a, a, a positive. Uh, I guess they would still be a drag to the extent that they're not probably at twenty percent yet. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then they mentioned freight, and that's a that's that can be a big one. And my guess is they'll continue to beat that one down because they'll probably start using more and more of their own trucks. But the two that I never hear anybody talk well, I hear people talking about the first of these two, but not the second. One is the FSD take rate can be massive in term because it, this is a cost of this is a um, an, addi a, a, an addition to revenues that has almost no cost of goods. And so you have a very large, uh, uh, you can sometimes, if somebody buys FSD that uh, six, uh, a year after they purchase the car, you're getting almost as much profit, maybe more profit from that FSD purchase than you did from the car. And so we know that the yeah. take rate is going up and probably will continue to go up. So this should be a, a, a major impact. Yeah. Yeah. All of those are true on the, on the logistics side. Remember there's an inbound and an outbound. And one of the things that Tesla drives is increased localization around their factories. So when they stand up a factory, it, there, there's a, there's a, a time phase in terms of when you stand up a factory, can you get, you know, all of your supply locally sourced, you know, think about a grocery store and how they try to drive local sourcing as well especially for produce and things like that. We'll just put that same thing to a factory. So when they stand up a factory, what they do is they draw supply from the, the most recent and, and, and lowest cost stable factory and supply, supply based footprint. Then over time, 
they they continue this localization trend of getting more and more of the supply local that cuts down on inbound freight uh, dramatically. And of course, there's a push pull on that. Sometimes the local source can't even with freight can't get you the right pricing. But um, but that that trend is going to continue. And like you said, as they start using more and more of their vehicles for outbound, um, you know, that will that will continue as well. The other thing is they got rid of that delivery wave and they're, you know, they're 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 more static. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not trying to, you know, drive, you know, 40, 50 percent of the volume in the last month of the quarter. And that's one of the reasons you see them putting the incentives on earlier. And, you know, this is a, a big shot in the bare thesis of, you know, these massive interest rate incentives put on Tesla, you know, classifies them, you know, in a, in a fairly aggressive way in the balance sheet. Um, you know, or say a conservative way, I should say. And, and, you know, margins went up and they went up significantly and they beat significantly. And then, yeah. And to your point, the, there more and more components of their revenue are very, very, very high gross margin. And this is why there has to be this flip in, in the analyst community of like, you can't just be putting them in the single digit multiple auto category, this company builds and ships software that people like and that they're buying. And you can't look at their CapEx and think like, well, they're just building factories to make more widgets. No, they're actually building AI factories to output, um, you know, data and to, to train, to, to train these, to train these systems so that these vehicles on the road can do inference and drive themselves and that people will pay for it. So the, Tesla is just the, you know, this whole thing of the product is the factory, you know, statement they made a couple of years ago. There's a couple of, they, not only are they doing gigafactories to build, you know, energy and cars, they have an AI factory and they have the biggest, the biggest cluster right now that's going to be lit up. It's not even in these, you know, we're not even seeing the impact of it yet and, and we will soon. So yeah, they're redefining to your point, Randy, of, of, where margins and revenue come from. And that's why you can't put them in one category. So the other one that I believe has been missing, I've been talking about it for a year and I, I don't get any traction. Maybe it's because it's so hard to think about if you don't have any kind of a, of a, a accounting background. And that is the IRA money for the battery packs and the battery production. And I just did a quick uh, set of numbers this morning we, we, we shipped something over 16,000 cyber trucks in the quarter. The rough, there, there's a rough, 123 kilowatt hours of battery in that battery pack. And the US government is giving Tesla 45 bucks for every one of those kilowatt hours. You do the multiplication, you're over $5,000 per vehicle coming in that IRA check. You do that times 16,700, whatever it was on the cyber trucks, you're getting close to $100 million in this quarter in terms of a, a, a reduction in cost of goods. Yeah. And Tesla in a roundabout way um, spoke to that by saying the, you know, the 4680 is on its way again, net of import duties. Remember right. the other guys, if you try to import the other guys, there's a 25, now there's a 25% tariff. Right. Before it was interesting. I think there, there was a, I think there were, there wasn't a tariff on the raw materials, but there was on, on finished packs and now they put it on both. But anyway, the other guys have a 25% um, penalty for it, for import. So if you, yeah, you have to put that in the equation. And then of course you net in the IRA incentives. And the economics are working out here for Tesla. And you're right. It's, this is something that can continue to grow. And just for, for everyone who thinks that, you know, November 5th or January 20th, that can change with the stroke of a pen. That's just not how our country works. The, this is a law. The IRA is a law. And you, you, can't, you can't take a law and put an executive order over that law and completely turn that law, you know, 180 degrees the other way. Um, so anyway, it, 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 and by the way, uh, th this bat, these batteries, this battery assembly that Tesla is doing, these are in red States, Nevada may go red here. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, Texas. And so 
it, who knows? It's going to be kind of a, a an, an unpredictable time here coming up. But I, I, I would venture to guess that for those that think it's just going to go one direction based on one person getting in the office, I think you have to do more critical thinking on it. Yeah, you you have a Congress that is is, you know, still very up in the air as to how it's going to turn out. So Correct. I just read an article yesterday saying that, uh, you know, a fairly a fairly astute uh, consideration saying that it looks like the Dems could still win the uh, House at this point, even though the Senate seems to be going to the Republicans. So it's a very it's a cloudy cloudy uh, picture. Personally, I think that uh, I would prefer, and I bet you if I could get Elon and get him into a wrestling match, he would say he would like to keep these battery and pack credits, but reduce them, that they're just too big. Uh, but but, they, but that they're, because it's a strategic item for the United States to be in the battery business, that it's probably a good idea to continue to incentivize them at some level. Yeah, the number one and number two uh, sell and pack providers in EV are cattle and BYD. These are Chinese companies. And China invested in their battery supply chain. This goes back to the Obama years from a mineral refining perspective. And so you anyway, this is a multi-decade type investment and we're way behind. So I I, I do think it would be important it would be important if if we have a Republican you know, executive office, and we'll probably have split government. But to have, to say like we're going to not have any strategy around, you know, battery supply chain, and I think that's that's wrong. And and hopefully, you know, we, we get, you know, cooler heads and, and more well, uh, there's a well, more well thought out plan around that. And by the way, we were close on the IRA to some really bad decisions on the IRA. There was a the proposal floated from, you know, the the current president of, of putting an additional five thousand on for union made yes. um, vehicles, and then uh, I think Joe Manchin was uh, you know, one that really pushed to make sure that we drive more and more U.S. content on the battery side and not let this thing be open where anybody can, or even you know, favored nations can just ship us every anything that they want uh, in perpetuity. That there's kind of this growing, escalating. A U.S. content thing. So anyway, we're getting a little bit far down the path, but I think your your point, your call out on the IRA and and the impact on Cybertruck is 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 worthy. Yeah, and of course we got the CATL uh, battery line coming on stream, maybe even this year. I would be surprised if it's not, you know, at some level of ramp right now. The the one in Reno, um, plus the additional lines that are supposed to be going up both in uh, in uh, Austin and eventually in Reno of the 4680. So the, the the amount of money that could be coming from IRA could be, uh, I've, I've estimated that even later next year, we could be looking at a billion dollars per quarter or more of IRA money. And that's all, again, goes to cost of goods of either the cars or the, uh, or the um, mega packs. So let's go to mega packs for a minute before we run out of time here. Um, uh, again, I think uh, our the analysts in our community are well aware of the of the uh, potential for mega packs, but the analysts outside of our community is, is a footnote on every article I read. And believe me, I read a lot of articles in the last mm-hmm. eight hours, and it's a footnote. It's like if, if they mention it at all, it's like oh yeah, and they also have yeah. this. You say, um, but the numbers on it are getting to be huge. Um, and, uh, Elon, I think the, the news that if I'd been a reporter, it might've been my headline, um, was Elon said, was no longer talking about one terawatt of, of, uh, energy storage, but rather terawatts of energy storage and terawatts of energy storage. It, we're talking about trillions, <laughs> yeah, you know, at least a trillion dollars per year, of, uh, but even if you go even go near term, Randy, there there was a there was a statement in I forgot which page, but it was the energy page in the earnings deck. They changed the wording in the deck, and I posted about this. In the last earnings deck, they said Shanghai would start production in Q1, and in this earnings deck, they said they'll start sh- shipping in Q1. And you know it. And I know it, if you brought up a factory, there's a big difference between starting 
the production and pilot process versus being qualified to ship to customers. That means between these two earnings reports, and maybe it happened before, but they're now comfortable to report a several week pull in on the Shanghai mega pack factory. And it looks like it's going to be a lot bigger and have a lot more output than Lathrop. So that's why when Elon said, you know, getting to 150 gigawatts of energy soon. Yeah. <laughs> that to me, my ears, like, okay, that's kind of a big, so Lathrop got to the 40 gigawatt run rate on a week basis. That was another, you know, new, uh, uh, a, a headline. And then you said getting to 150 gigawatts soon. And then you have Shanghai pulling in. I mean, this was, I mean, that, that was a home run on the energy side. And it was great to see the director of that operation get promoted to, to vice president this morning, uh, Michael Snyder, that well-deserved. Again, it shows the Tesla bench strength as well. I would have to think, I mean, you know, I'm always the optimist, but I would have to think that if you can put that factory up as fast as they did in Shanghai <clears throat> and have it producing, you know, you and I both know that different products take different amounts of time to get to the point of production. I mean, as as somebody who is making bicycle water bottles, um, you know, I might be looking at three months from the decision to put in a new machine to the time when I'm starting to ship bottles. It's a lot different than putting a car together yeah. over three years or something. So in this battery pack situation, uh, the mega packs, it appears that it's a pretty fast ramp because they're talking about ramping to half the capacity of this new facility in the first quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, you know, China's speed is, is, is a real thing. Um, if you're in supply chain, you're building hardware, you're building product there, there is a thing called, uh, China speed, you know, by the way, Korea is really fast as well. There's other countries that are pretty, that are super fast, but, but, but countries like China, when they, when you say China speed, they have all the resources, all the infrastructure around it. So if you're building fixturing, you're building tooling, all these things, you could fill up, you know, you could fill up a, you know, a gigantic room in, in minutes of you needed 10 tooling engineers, you can get them really quick. Um, similar in, in Korea, uh, but China is really pulling away there. So there is a thing called China speed. So not only will that facility, uh, here's a takeaway, not only will that facility be complete in construction pretty quickly, but you, to your point, that ramp curve is going to be steeper than much steeper than, than Lathrop. By the way, they're going to also be able to depend on all the lessons learned that came from the Lathrop team. Right. So there's, they, they have the benefits, um, of that, Absolutely. but you know, they, they work, they work faster. And then my thought would be, there's going to be an announcement. If, if he's talking about, uh, Ter terawatt terawatts not one but multiple terawatts it's it, they, they have to make an announcement of another building going up i mean we got to be he's, he can't be talking terawatts and not be yeah i i would be i wouldn't be surprised if there's not multiple mega pack factory announcements i've never been one by the way even though i'm in manufacturing to like wanting, wanting to count tesla factories and draw some sort of like significant conclusion from that because they can also take their existing facilities and retrofit them and get greater output is like what we're seeing in the auto facilities as well. So it's hard to, 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 it's not so much linear, but yeah, I, I, to your point, I do, I can see them announcing more facilities for sure. Okay. Last thing would be FSD and the roadmap. Um, you did a, uh, you responded to a, uh, uh, post on X this morning that went into a lot of detail about the, what needs to be done, where we are, where it's going. Um, speak to where you, what you, what were your learnings over the last 24 hours with regard to the FSD roadmap? And do you think that, that Elon should, is his confidence is well placed this time that we'll be uh, putting out model threes and model Ys into the uh, robotaxi world, uh, you know, mid year. Yeah. So if this is where analysts really need to, to pay attention and they need to look at some of these posts from some, from certain people, I would say, and, and really go, you know, get off a of TV and go do this homework. It's really important. Tesla gave you a glimpse of what happened in the year prior and they connected the dots of their performance. Um, and then where we are today, 
and and they use that same logic to apply to where they think they'll be you know in the future and before they were making future predictions without showing you the connection of the progress that they had made over the past year since they went to end to end neural nets and they went to this whole new system and approach so now that they've shown the the data in arrears and they and there's and there's you know a relationship that's starting to align and follow scaling laws now when they start projecting out and they start using that same logic it may be they're not going to get it down to the day or the week there may be some movement plus or minus a few months but there's certainly this isn't going to be like are we are we years and years off of these predictions anymore um there's there's now a foundation there's now um a, a a corollary that they didn't have before we're not floating in free space anymore there's something that we can actually anchor to and and put a stake in the ground so study it you know put put some put some you know probability of occurrence on it there's nothing that's 100% um but they certainly elevated the probability of success and the probability of their predictions got a lot more tighter based on you know based on what they did they they laid it out for you in the call it, and if and if it's not clear to you and you're an analyst in this community and you're talking about this you're talking about tesla and you're comparing them to other companies you should go talk to somebody that can explain that data to you it's really important uh and I would say the other there's other data points that are supporting it too. The the Palo Alto, um, you know, news that came out that that you know that city that council those government officials are interested in and there's already robo taxi rides being given to employees. It's already being used. The right. Tesla network is an app, and I I've seen this inside of companies before where there's the external app that we all use, mm -hmm. and then there's the version that's available inside of the company and the version of the app that's available inside of the company, the Tesla app they've got a ride hailing network and they're using it in the area. And so you have the city and government officials involved. They were at the, we robot event. We didn't know that that was news this, right. this week, this past week. And you're start, so you're, now you're starting to connect the data, the performance, you now have an anchor to the data. Now you have government officials and regulators positively talking about it. You know that they were invited to the event and these things are all starting to connect so it's it's getting more and more reasonable and then they have the vehicles they're out there they have millions of vehicles that are already hardware enabled so uh if you're analyzing robo taxis and you just look at this from a scale perspective you know the tesla curve is going to look something like this you know when they ramp whereas the others are kind of you know this flat um this flat thing that's happening over many years and over time. So I, I, that was to me, one of the biggest take top three takeaways from the call. I was, uh, there was a, there was a, um, what do you call it? An asterisk on that as well with the uh, completely shutting down the bears with regard to hardware three um, and, and uh, saying, no, we'll just replace it if necessary. <laughs> Yeah, and and there was a, there was an interesting twist on that because when Elon was asked about this before, his original thought was, well, if I had to do that, then I'd have to retrofit the cameras, the harnesses, and everything else. And I think what they've since learned is that this is really this is the computer and the 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 imaging performance of the old cameras versus the new. Like you can you could get there and you could do it, but regardless, this this is tesla has made this is this goes back to the original first principles approach you're building something that's going to be an autonomous vehicle is this vehicle going to cost you know have have 10 15 20 30 thousand dollars of sensors and transformation costs to tear down and rebuild the car or are you going to spend about twelve hundred dollars between the computer the ceiling of that computer the wire harnesses and the cameras. And now if you had to do something like this retrofit, by the way, those hardware three AI three computers that they pull out, they can put them in and use them for training. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you, you're, you're, 
the 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 approach and philosophy of the company is kind of all connecting this high reuse high platforming um you know low complexity it's it's all kind of starting to work together and yeah they did take a big argument away uh from the bear and a lot of people were just grasping onto that oh if your hardware no well they said they would replace it if it would it'd be a problem and i and i, I would factor it in that they are going to have to do that yeah. but again from a capital perspective, they could probably redeploy those and, and reuse them. Yeah, and and we talked about this on my show last night with Brian Wong. Is that even if it's a thousand bucks to replace it, you know, between the the chip itself and the and the labor to put it in, um, if it's a thousand bucks a unit, that's nothing compared to the revenue. And the only ones they're going to replace are the people that are going to be using it for revenue. If I have a right. if I have a hardware three car and I'm not going to put it out for revenue, I I don't need the level. Of, uh, capacity, of of capability that the that the robo taxi does. Yeah, the time the time to break even is what people talk about, and they'll be measured in weeks and right. months, maybe. Right. Exactly. All right. So, so thank you so much for coming on at an unusual time, but I thought this would be a great time to have you on because you'd have a chance to really think through. Because uh, yesterday, I mean, my brain was hurting. I mean, it was ready yeah. to you know, explode <laughs> at the at the end of the day. Uh, again, uh, yeah, and what, yeah, absolutely. We didn't talk about Optimus. Oh, uh, well, there wasn't much about Optimus. Well, there's one statement, and, okay. and it is, I think, is the takeaway statement for analysts and others, which was uh, there's a lot of companies building or talking about building humanoids, but they don't have the AI brain and capability to build that brain that Tesla does. And they don't have the ability to volume scale the components and the system assembly required. And Tesla's obviously demonstrated that. Those those two things people should just put in their brain and lock away when you're when you start thinking about this. And again, I uh, uh, humanoid robots does not have to be a winner take all market, yeah. but they can certainly have significant market share. And the TAM, I agree with Elon, will be probably you know well north of any other product built before. Right. Yeah, no, I thought that, I thought that, but, I, but, but basically that wasn't new as Jeff is why I, I didn't bring it up. We, yeah. we people that are paying attention like you would yeah. have already known those things. So yeah. yeah. All right. Um, before I lose my voice completely this morning, I don't know what's going on, but it's getting raspier and raspier. Stop <laughs> screaming. Stop screaming, Randy. <laughs> Stop screaming. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jeff, as always, for coming on. And to all of you out yeah, there, thanks. it's been great talking to you.